Ça, c'est un espace qui gagne plusieurs langues. Este es un espacio multilingüe. This is a multilingual space. C'est un espace plurilingue. Pour t'aider à l'interprétation qui sortit dans l'espagnol ou soit anglais pour langue créole, Tant puis cliquez sur globe là, sur bord droite là en bas. Et puis cliquez sur Haitian Creole, qui c'est créole haïtien, pour tenter l'interprétation. Si vous appelez le téléphone cellulaire, cliquez sur More, qui c'est Plus. Après ça, Interpretation, qui c'est Interprétation. Après ça, Haitian Creole, qui c'est créole haïtien. Et puis au fini. Pour entendre l'interprétation en français, Veuillez cliquer sur le globe en bas à droite, puis cliquez sur « Français »,« French » pour entendre l'interprétation. Si vous êtes branché sur votre cellulaire, cliquez sur « Plus »,« More », puis sur « Interprétation linguistique »,« Interpretation », puis sur « Français » et « Terminé » ou « Done ». To hear interpretation into English, please click on the globe on the bottom right. Then click on « English » to hear the interpretation. If you're calling from your cell phone, click on More, then Language Interpretation, then English, and Done. Si está conectada a través de su computadora y quiere escuchar la interpretación al español, favor de hacer clic en el globo que aparece a mano derecha. Luego haz clic en Español para escuchar la interpretación. Si está llamando desde su celular, haz clic en More, luego Interpretation o Interpretación, luego Español, y finalizado o done.
Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bonjour, bon dia, hola, and what's going on? Hello, good people. And thank you for joining us for this important panel, Inextricably Linked. My name is Paris Hatcher. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I'm the founder and executive director of Black Feminist Future. I'm joining this panel today from Muskogee Creekland, also known as Atlanta. And I have so much appreciation to the Black Feminist Future team, as well as our incredible panelists, who will be leading us in such an important conversation in these important times. <clears throat> Again, our panel is inextricably linked. The interwoven liberation struggles in Palestine, Co Palestine, Congo, Haiti, and Atlanta. Today, we are joined by organizers, thinkers, activists from the front lines of critical struggles. We're hearing about these struggles wherever we turn on the TV, and oftentimes the TV and the media that we are receiving is incredibly biased and is spreading dis and misinformation. One that benefits those who are in power, not those who are impressed, or those who are oppressed. We know that what's happening are critical struggles for liberation, for freedom, sovereignty, and against colonization and genocide. During this conversation, we will discuss the context or the roots of the oppression and injustice. We also will be using, and folks, our panelists will be describing the terms that we've been hearing, like settler, settler colonialism, like what actually is solidarity and how communities are responding and fighting back. Wherever there is uh, resistance, our people are on the front line. At this time of linked devastation and displacement and also dif disinformation, Black Feminist Future knows that it's really important that we scale up and build the analysis of Black feminists and our, and, and our allies to be able to respond, to think critically and to respond critically, as well as helping to develop your Black feminist politics. We see this panel as an opportunity. As a part of our conversation today, I wanna to ground in what Black Feminist Future calls our meridians. Our meridians are our, our principles. It's the way that we live out our values. When we think about our meridians, we really are guided by three that we wanna be in conversation with today with you. One is that we see that our struggles are linked. Two, we really squat up for each other. And three, we make the invisible visible. So by today, we're gonna to be hearing stor stories as well as analysis from an incredible panelist who are really talking about and lifting up what we must understand, what we need to know during this important critical time. A little bit about Black Feminist Future. If you go back to the previous slide, please. The one before. Black Feminist Future is a political hub. The one before, please, thank you. Thank you. Focus on the dynamic possibilities of galvanizing the social and political power of Black women, girls, and gender expansive people toward liberation. We do this by building and nourishing the leadership of Black feminists, fortifying aligned organizations and movements and shifting cultural norms. Earlier this, um, this year, I would say about October, uh, mid-October, Black Feminist Future released a statement in solidarity um, to the people of, in Palestine. And not only the people in Palestine, our members have been active in fights to stop Cop City, as well as bringing attention to the issues of what's happening on the continent of Africa, in particular in Congo. We know that our people, in particular feminists, queer and trans people and women and girls are on the front line in defense of their selves and their lives as well as the state and the future of where they live. And so I'd like to give a introduction of our incredible panelists to get us, who's gonna lead us through an incredible conversation for today. Christina Francois is a political scientist, policy advisor, writer and scholar. 
and her work focuses on the political power of Black migrants and Haitians throughout the Western Hemisphere and the intersections of climate, gender, racial, and migrant justice through a decolonial lens. Welcome, Christina. Isan, who uses any pronouns, is a proud Palestinian and Guatemalan organizer and member of the Palestinian Youth Movement, who has been in movement space here in Atlanta since 2019. Isan co-authored a, pick, a piece titled From Black Atlanta to Palestine, a statement of connection, solidarity, and survival. Again, very, 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 very important. And we've been writing about this as many of our Black Feminist North Stars have been writing about this as well. Speaking about Black Feminist North Stars, Barbara Ransby is the John D. MacArthur Chair, Distinguished Professor of History, Gender and Women's Studies, and Black Studies at, at the University of Illinois at Chicago. She's authored incredible books. She's a incredible longstanding Black feminist activist, author, and scholar. And in 2011, co-led a historic Indigenous and Feminists of Color human rights delegation to Palestine. Jolie Masai holds a master diploma in international relations. She serves as the president of the Congolese Association of University Women affiliated with the Graduate Women, with Graduate Women International. She's recognized as a feminist activist, directing her efforts towards the empowerment of Congolese girls and women through education and advocacy for justice and equal opportunities. Last, but certainly not least, is Mary Hooks. Mary is a Black lesbian feminist, abolitionist, Pan-African mother, wife, and member of Southerners on New Ground, and part of the leadership of the Movement for Black Lives. Mary joined Song in 2009 and, you know, has done, has launched one of my favorite campaigns, which is Freedom Black Mamas, and has been on the front line here in Atlanta around stopping Cop City. It is with my pleasure and deep gratitude that I introduce each one of you panelists to join us to be in conversation. And I want to cue you up, Barbara, to do some of that context. I just shared in 2011 that you co-led a delegation of feminists of color, feminist indigenous um, women of color to Palestine. And truly I mentioned that because we know that the solidarity work, calling out the atrocities and being in solidarity with the Palestinian people is not new, even though for many of us, it may be the first time that we're seeing it with the genocide that's happening in real time. I would love for you, Barbara, if possible, I have a lot of questions for you, but could you provide the historical context of, of the liberation struggles that we're seeing? We're, we're talking about just some of them. They're not all the struggles that are happening right now. Can you share how Black feminists have been active on the front line of these struggles? And what does it mean to be an internationalist as a part of building your Black feminist politic? Welcome, Barbara Bransby. You're on mute, Barbara. Yes, I sure am. Thank you. There Sandy. you go. Uh, yeah, thank you for that uh, introduction and that invitation. You know, I'm so grateful to be on this panel. I've been on many panels on um, Palestine and the atrocities of what are taking place in Gaza right now, but I appreciate this one as multi-focused, multifaceted, um, because I do think, as the title suggests, these struggles are inextricably linked. You know, a critical pillar uh, of Black feminist politics from the Combahee River Collective uh, to radical Black women to Black feminist futures today uh, is internationalism. You know, intersectionality has an internationalist uh, component. And so Black feminists have been and continue to be um, in solidarity with and on the front lines in places around the world uh, fighting for a more inclusive, radical, liberatory future. Um, in 2011, you mentioned the delegation I went on. It was an indigenous and women of color. It was an indigenous and feminist of color uh, delegation. And we particularly went so that we could do solidarity work more effectively. Uh, Beverly Guy Sheftall and Gina Dent and Angela Davis and Pramila Nadison were all a part of that uh, delegation. And for me, the entry point and interest in Palestine actually came from another struggle we're not talking about today, but on the African continent, which is the struggle uh, against apartheid South Africa. So the struggle against apartheid South Africa, one 
uh, other place in the African diaspora became the catalyst for the involvement of many of us uh, in the solidarity, Palestine solidarity struggle, because what we see is deep, deep parallels in the way neoliberalism is working today and the way in which apartheid and colonialism and settler colonialism, colonialism have worked uh, in the United States, in South Africa, and today um, in the colonial settler state of, of, of Israel. So this has been integral to uh, a black feminist praxis. Haiti, I had the privilege of going to um, and meeting with feminist organizations in Haiti uh, a number of years ago. Uh, and, you know, Haiti is, you know, since enslaved people rose up and ended uh, the system of slavery in Haiti. It's like the world has been punishing Haiti. And women have been in the forefront of that struggle. Uh, and so it was deeply inspiring for me to talk to women's organizations, some of those organizations um, deeply impacted by, um, you know, not only the violence there, but the the natural disasters and the lack of uh, support from around the world for Haiti in that period. And of course, we know, you know, the circumstances in the Congo, we'll hear more about it, uh, complicated, but women's struggle and women's suffering both have been, you know, at the forefront. And let me just go back to Palestine for a minute. You know, when we talk about Palestine and black feminist solidarity with Palestine, we have to think of our beloved sister, uh, June Jordan. We have to think of June Jordan's words in solidarity. And this was you know, at a time when there wasn't a lot of forward motion around Palestine. June Jordan challenged us to think of an extension of our political identity as an identity with the struggle of Palestine. And in doing that, she gets rid of notions of uh, essentialism. And I, I think actually what, I, what I'd like to do, Paris, if you'll allow me, um, which it, it, it partly answers your question is, there's a black feminist statement in solidarity with the people of Gaza that I wrote for the November 4th um, mobilization in Washington. And I just wanna read that because it includes uh, June Jordan's statement, but it also, I think, captures a lot of what many of us are feeling you know, in this moment when we're invited as internationalists, we're invited as people who reject the uh, uh, the borders that, that colonizers have carved out in the earth uh, as, as being lines of demarcation, it calls upon us to step up and stand up and speak out in this moment. So it, it's brief, I'll just read it and then I'll uh, let you go to your next question. Who are my people? Who are my people in this crucible moment of war and genocide? as we witness the dirty process of ethnic cleansing unfold before the eyes of the world. Who are my people? As tiny brown children are bombed in Southern Gaza as they flee the homes, their homes following the evacuation route prescribed by their bombers. Who are my people? As my friend's cousin gives birth in total darkness in Gaza city and incubators are shut down as the power is cut off in hospitals throughout the strip. No food, no water no fuel, just bombs. In Al-Zahra, whole buildings are leveled. Apartments where families cooked meals, lovers made love, children played games, and girls danced with their friends are all gone now. There is the hole in the heart of the Jabalia refugee camp. That hole is a bomb crater beneath which unknown and unnamed bodies are entombed. A broken man cradles his daughter whose little body has also been broken. A woman wails for the loss of her son. No parts of his body have been found. Who are my people? Who are my people in this crucible moment of violence and destruction in the name of defense? I was born a Palestinian woman. I was born a black woman and I became a Palestinian, wrote our beloved sister, the radical feminist poet, June Jordan. In that simple quote, she interrogates essentialist notions of identity and blood and belonging and challenges us all to be bigger than that. Who are your people, Ella Baker would ask visitors and strangers. Who claims you and who do you claim in this world? And most importantly, who do you stand with in times of crisis and despair? 
We do not need a DNA test or a genealogy search to know who our people are in this moment. If we choose to stand on the side of freedom, our people are the oppressed people of the world, people who are suffering under varied and violent forms of injustice and oppression from Haiti to Hebron, from Birmingham to Bethlehem, from Shatta prison in Northern Israel to Stateville prison in central Illinois. I claim my people as all those who are standing up to occupation and dispossession, heteropatriarchy and white supremacy, colonialism and settler colonialism, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, environmental pillage, carceral violence and authoritarianism. My people are the truth tellers and freedom fighters of the world, those speaking truth to power in dozens of languages. Silent vigils by the organization Women in Black on street corners in Barcelona and Tokyo and Madrid, saying no to war and occupation. Aswat, the queer Palestinian freedom fighters saying that liberation of Palestine must also be liberation for them. Courageous voices inside the halls of power refusing to be silenced. Rashida, Corey, Ilhan, Summer, we are with you because you are with us. And the passionate Jewish protesters that shut down Grand Central Station in New York and the Statue of Liberty and the Manhattan Bridge, insisting not in our name and that never again must mean never again to anyone. So as a little bit of context and a little bit of where we are now in terms of the situation in Palestine. And so I think I'll, I think I'll stop there, Paris. I mean, let me just say one more thing. I should say this as a historian. Um, you know, you mentioned that black solidarity with Palestine is nothing new. And we of course have a number of groups today, including black feminist futures and the movement for black lives, but also blacks for Palestine, radical black women uh, who are speaking out and organizing and taking action in solidarity with Palestine. Um, but in the summer of 1967, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee also took a position in solidarity with Palestine and wrote a very uh, bold and courageous statement um, uh, talking about, quote unquote, the atrocities against the native Arab inhabitants and the dispossession of Arab homes, land and livelihood uh, as being something they staunchly oppose. Black Panther Party met with the PLO in Algeria in 1969 and frequently featured um, Palestinian uh, stories and authors in the Black Panther newspaper. Of course, uh, Nelson Mandela and Malcolm X and Bishop Tutu and Alice Walker and many, many others um, you know, have, have spoken out and acted on behalf of Palestine self-determination and, and in solidarity. And the UN Conference Against Racism and Xenophobia in Durban, South Africa in 2011 further cemented that tradition uh, by holding up both the demand for reparations uh, and the demand for Palestinian freedom as two critical, critical uh, principles um, that kind of got lost in the follow-up to 9-11 that, that happened here, but, but it was a critical document and a critical moment. So I, I'll stop there. Um, I hope that was enough context. And I know that someone's gonna talk more about Congo and Haiti uh, in, a, in a little bit, but um, that gets us started and much more to say. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, by sharing your remarks, it's really clear that we are in good company. We are in good company of those who have spoken up, who have, who have claimed their solidarity, have said that solidarity is not just, it's a verb, it's something that you do, um, and have really been able to see the connection with Palestinian folks um, and the struggles of Black folks and the, the oppressed people around the world. And I really am resonating with this question around who are my people? And I think in this time, we are we're getting more clear around that, right? that we must be internationalist and that we understand our black feminist politics. Um, and that is really helping us find and expand even who our people are. Bissan, I would love to have you join our conversation now. And in particular, as someone who has been doing work with your community as, you know, as a Palestinian, we are all witnessing, I think some for the first time, many of us have been witnessing this, you know, for decades, the genocide that's happening in Palestine. Over 10,000 people are dead, a majority are children. 
the denial of food, water, medical care, electricity, the removal of people from indigenous land, the maligning in the middle in the media. You also, um, when I was introducing you, you shared the piece that you had written around the the solidarity between Black and Palestinian folks, and so. The saying, I'm curious around what you can offer, what should Black feminists know and understand about what's happening in Palestine and the work that the Palestinian youth movement is doing um, at this time. So welcome to Sam. Thank you so much. Um, it is such an honor to be here and to be participating in the legacy of Black and Palestinian solidarity as my uh, dear co-panelist Barbara had mentioned, this is not a new phenomenon of Black and Palestinian solidarity. Um, and it is such an honor to be here to represent that. I wanna say um, a, a few things just to situate ourselves in, in the situation that Palestinians are presently finding themselves in as we are in a quote unquote ceasefire period. There's negotiations happening up, um, regarding hostages and uh, um, Palestinians who have been taken um, prisoner. Uh, currently, there are around 12,000 Palestinians being held hostage in Israeli military prisons. Thousands are being held under administrative detention, uh, which is basically just being held without any trial, without being, being able to have any contact with their families, um, without being able to speak to a, a lawyer. And uh, this is all because Israeli prisons exist to repress Palestinian liberation efforts, to strip Palestinians of their autonomy, and to sear their consciousness and further fragment Palestinian society. Uh, I think it is really important to understand that we are where we are at right now because of the ongoing catastrophe, the 75 years of repression, the 75 years of illegal occupation and ethnic cleansing. Um, this particular incident began as out of out of an act of resistance to which uh, as we know colonized and oppressed people have the right to resist their oppressors and their occupiers and specifically an act of resistance as a result of as i said the tens of thousands of palestinians uh, who are being held in in prison and are being tortured. And these prisoners include women and children. Um, and it's unfortunate that we even have to even try to humanize Palestinians or make them perfect victims by saying, yes, even women and children as well. And um, so it's really important to understand that context as to why we are where we are at today with regards to Palestine. And I would say that the Palestinian Youth Movement, uh, we are a transnational grassroots organization. And um, many of our chapters are here in North America. We've been um, coordinating efforts for the Shut It Down Weeks of Action. Uh, uh, we're involved in the organizing of the largest pro-Palestine protests in history in Washington, DC on November 4th. And um, just continuing to push the narrative the correct narrative around Palestine or the framing of what is happening in Palestine. Um, as we know, the narrative, the mainstream narrative is very much um, Islamophobic and anti-Palestinian. Um, uh, yeah, so I would just say uh, to continue to follow the work of Palestinian youth movement, I would also like to shout out the Palestinian Feminist Collective they will put out very soon a um, Black and Palestinian solidarity timeline, which I think could be very useful for uh, just understanding how deep the connection between back, Black and Palestinian solidarity goes. And for sure, you know, even if we are, you know, waking up to these connections now, um, for sure, the, they have they have existed and they have existed for uh a, a, a long time. And um, um, my co-panelist Barbara was bringing me to tears with that statement, um, you know, uh, where June Jordan was challenging us to reject essentialism and just saying that, you know, we can find ourselves um, in, in, our, in, in our shared struggles. Uh, 
I would also say that it is important to understand the similarities in which gendered violence is inflicted on us as Palestinian people and as Black folks, and how the painting of Palestinian Arab Muslim men as rapists and abusers of women is similar to anti-Black characterizations of Black men, for example, um, the way that Palestinian and Black women are ungendered or degendered by their oppressors in the sense that, like you could say for Palestinian women, they're often maligned as birthers of terrorists or they don't, their, their womanhood is not sacred enough to the oppressor where they're able to um, birth and raise their children in dignity. Um, there is nothing sacred in the eyes of the oppressor. And this um, further extends to the way that gendered violence is uh, enacted upon us and our, and our, our people. Um, I will stop there. Uh, I would love to Thank hear you. the questions. I know there's so much that can be said and um, I would be happy to address anything. Bisan, thank you. I am, I had um, written this down as, um, and you just, you amplified it, which is really important that for Black feminists, when we are thinking about what's happening, um, these conflicts, these battles actually have a impact on the body and especially on our gendered bodies that we know patriarchal violence um, as, is, a, is used as a weapon of war and conquest through, um, through violence, through rape, through dispossession. Um, it is um, so important that you lift that up a part of the narrative that is told about people in the global South is around the, um, yes, it's, it's the um, the birthers, right? These, and giving birth to all of these young people who are gonna just take over the world, right? Which is absolutely breeds this idea of not seeing people in their humanity and their fullness and forwards xenophobic and racist narratives that is really important that we interrupt. And so we must understand and see um, as black feminists and as feminists broadly, um, the particulars, the gendered particulars of what happens um, in violence um, and, and in places where there's conflict that the bodies of children, the bodies of women, of queer and trans people um, are precarious and our sites of particular violence. So I'm so glad that you um, lifted, lifted that up because it's really important. Jolie, um, welcome. I am really glad to be in conversation and inviting you into this conversation. As we were talking about patriarchal violence and thinking about the gendered realities of um, women, girls, and gender expansive people in sites of conflict, and in particular, um, discussions about Congo have been more readily happening, but still we don't really know as much as that we need to know. You know, the media here, it's absolutely, it uplifts the stories of those um, who are in power. And we oftentimes do not get access to the global story of what's happening. So Jolie, I would really, appreciate if you could give us context for what is happening in the Congo right now and why is it a critical Black feminist issue? Welcome. Merci. Merci, Paris. Merci pour cette opportunité, en tout cas. Euh, je me rappelle la dernière fois, j'ai eu à parler un peu de la situation de la RDC à une certaine audience, c'était à la Commission des Nations Unies pour le statut de la femme à New York. Mais euh, je, je comptais beaucoup sur cette opportunité parce que je vois que c'est une organisation des femmes noires et je pense que ma voix euh, va peut-être porter plus haut au travers de, 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 de cette intervention. 
Donc, euh, la situation que traverse la RDC n'est pas très, très différente de ce qui se passe en Palestine, en fait. Elle n'est pas très différente. Euh, ça fait pratiquement 28 ans que l'est de la RDC, en particulier l'est de la RDC, la RDC a une superficie de près de 2 345 000 km2 et l'est de la RDC a pratiquement 4, ou 5, 4 provinces et cette, ce, ce, cette partie de, du, du pays est en proie des, des conflits, des guerres depuis plus de 25 ans. Ça va faire peut-être 27 ou 28 ans maintenant. Et euh, la particularité de ce conflit, c'est que ce sont les femmes et les enfants qui sont mis, euh, qui sont en ligne de mire, en fait. C est, c est, c est, ce sont les femmes qui sont les premières victimes de cette, de cette insécurité, de ces crises, de, ce, de ces crises, de cette guerre qui nous a été imposé depuis plus de, 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 de 25 ans. Alors, ce qui se passe généralement en temps de guerre, euh, les femmes et les enfants sont, sont, euh, portent sur eux, euh, sur leurs épaules, le poids de la famille. Parce que le père est soit en guerre et soit euh, 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 mobilisé euh, pour la guerre ou soit décédé. Généralement, les hommes partent et ce sont les femmes qui sont exposées avec les enfants parce que la femme doit sortir pour aller chercher à manger pour ses enfants ou chercher un endroit euh, euh, qui est plus sécurité, où il y a plus de sécurité euh, pour ses enfants. Ce qui fait que elle est, elle est très exposée. Aujourd'hui, euh, on parle pratiquement de 1 million 800 000 femmes qui sont violées qui ont été violées, je vais, je vais prendre, ce sont les chiffres de, de MSF de 2020, qui ont été violées au moins une fois dans leur vie. C'est énorme, c'est vraiment énorme. Donc la femme, la femme travaille depuis longtemps. Ça remonte même de l'époque coloniale où le colonisateur, euh, le colonisateur, nous, nous avons été colonisés par les Belges, et le colonisateur considérait les autochtones hommes comme irresponsables, à qui on devait donner les ordres, etc. Et à, et à côté, la femme faisait tout le travail, tout le travail de chant et tout. Mais avec le temps, cela a évolué, mais du point de vue social, cette femme n'a toujours pas de place dans la société. Cette femme, la femme congolaise, n'a toujours pas de place. Elle n'a pas de place, elle n'est pas considérée, elle n'est pas, euh, pas responsable, elle n'est pas vraiment, c'est une poignée de femmes qui sont aujourd'hui qui peuvent se lever aujourd'hui, qui partent à l'université, qui finissent leurs études et qui partent à l'université, qui deviennent des, 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 des personnes dans la société. Vraiment, c'est juste une poignée euh, de, 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 de femmes congolaises. Donc, euh, plus tard, la vision du colonisateur a évolué en promouvant uniquement les hommes avec notre système de patriarcat, c'est-à-dire dans une famille où il y a cinq filles et un garçon, euh, s'il n'y a pas d'argent pour payer les frais de, de scolarité, on accordera la priorité aux garçons pour aller à l'école et les filles euh, sont bonnes pour être mariées. Cela a existé. Je pensais que quand j'étais petite, c'est ce qu'on nous disait, qu'il y a le early marriage, euh, le, le mariage précoce dans, dans les provinces, dans les, 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 les fins fonds de, 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 du pays. Mais en fait, jusqu'aujourd'hui, cette histoire existe. Au Kassai, par exemple, cette histoire existe où le choix est fait pour envoyer le garçon à l'école et non la fille. Et donc, voilà. Et euh, plus tard, euh, bon, ce, 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 ce système de patriarcat qui, en fait, valorise seulement l'homme et non la femme a même des conséquences aujourd'hui, même dans, dans sa représentativité, dans les, les, les sociétés, dans le gouvernement, dans, dans la gestion même de, de, de la politique, de la gestion quotidienne de la politique, la femme est, est absente. Donc, les, les effets du, colonia, du, colonia, du colonialisme nous suivent jusqu'à présent. Donc, il y a encore des effets du colonialisme sur nous et c'est ça, en fait, qui fait que la femme est, 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 est vraiment exposée jusqu'à ce jour. Donc, euh, les, les chiffres sont, sont accablants. Les, les chiffres sont, 
sont vraiment accablants. Je ne sais pas si on doit parler de génocide ici en RDC parce que cela dure quand même depuis plus de 26 ans. Je ne sais pas si on doit parler de génocide, mais les chiffres sont très accablants. Les femmes sont livrées à elles-mêmes, les enfants n'en parlons pas, l'éducation est devenue très difficile, l'accès même à la santé, ces femmes qui sont violées à l'est du pays, il n'y a qu'un seul hôpital pour plus de 10 millions de, de, de femmes violées euh, à l'est du pays, avec le docteur Mukwege, qui est le prix Nobel de la paix, qui a été prix Nobel de la paix, son hôpital de Panzi, qui est à l'est du pays, c'est le seul hôpital qui reçoit les femmes qui sont violées. On l'appelle même réparateur des femmes. C'est le seul hôpital à l'est du Congo. L'accès aux soins est difficile, l'accès de, de, aux soins est pratiquement impossible à cause de la guerre et aussi à cause du manque des infrastructures. Donc, euh, voilà un peu euh, ce que je peux dire de la situation qui se passe euh, ici en RDC. Elle est critique. Oui, la situation est critique et je pense que les femmes congolaises doivent se lever et avec l'aide des autres femmes noires de, 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 de partout, nous devons nous lever pour essayer de, 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 de trouver une solution pour, pour, pour la femme congolaise. C'est vrai, on en parle dans les journaux, on en parle, mais est-ce qu'on en fait une priorité Est-ce que la communauté internationale en fait une priorité Je ne sais pas. On n'a pas d'écho par rapport à ça. On parle de la Palestine, on parle de de, 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 de l'Ukraine, on parle de ça, mais c'est vraiment difficile qu'on entende parler de la RDC, de la femme congolaise qui est violée tous les jours. C'est assez difficile. Donc, c'est un peu ça la situation que traverse la RDC actuellement euh, euh, par rapport aux femmes. Merci. Jolie, merci beaucoup. Merci à vous. I really thank you very much um, for what you've shared. And I think what you've really brought up, and it's something that Barbara kicked us off with, and I'm thinking about, if we think about this panel as a way to develop our Black feminist analysis and our Black feminist toolbox, then we must understand um, colonialism. What Jolie mentioned around Belgium as a colonial power, what can be said around Britain in the context of um, the Palestinian context, What could be said about the French in Haiti when we're getting ready to talk about Haiti next, the U.S. context as well, the different, you know, Britain, you know. I saw a quote on Twitter that said colonization is not a one-time event. It's an ongoing story. And many, if, you know, the root that we're, we're talking about is colonization. It's the idea that's backed by an ideology of supremacy and dominance that folks deserve, you know, will have dominion over your land, extract its resources. What's happening in Congo is that we still see that people are facing incredible violence while resources, while it has some of the most beneficial, the most incredible resources that are benefiting so many people. Yet, you just talked about a hospital that has to serve Um, hundreds of thousands of people, right? That it is really resources are being ripped from the earth, yet the people who live there have no access. They do not benefit, right? Exactly. They toil the earth. Um, and so when we think about that, when we think about the impact of colonization, the hundreds of years is really important as Black feminists that we understand and that we sharpen that be in conversations around what is colonization. It's not something that's happened in the past. It is ongoing. Christina, I'd like to bring you into the conversation as we focus around thinking about what's happening in Haiti. Um, I really appreciate what Barbara mentioned. I think for many of us in the diaspora, we see Haiti as this really beacon of hope and possibility of, liber of liberation and revolution. And um, Haiti has been punished for being that beacon. Um, since 1804, right? That's in 1804, I was getting, is it 03 or 04? And so can you share with us what's happening in Haiti right now, especially thinking about this, you know, colonization, really this new batch of, you know, new powers coming in to, to take control of Haiti and making a connection between what's happening in Haiti and, and these other sites of struggle we've mentioned in Palestine and um, Congo. 
Definitely. Thank you so much for, for having me. I think it's funny you had mentioned you saw something online. I saw something online recently that really spoke to me in preparing for, you know, for our conversation, which was that Haiti delivered the flo- the first blow to colonialism and Palestine is going to deliver the final blow, right? And that we are in this struggle together um, that again it is a it is a constant process and i think of the other ways that our struggles are linked is really issues around um you know resource extraction around ethnic cleansing uh around um all of these these external forces that work um tirelessly to be able to to separate and and punish our communities and so um the last 20 years in Haiti, I can't even, when I was thinking about where do I start, like the last 20 years in Haiti have been really difficult, starting from um, the political instability under um, Aristide, uh, Aristide's second term, which led to a U.S.-U.N. occupation force, um, which had ended up remaining for over a decade, um, where we have, where is honestly an occupation. I think um, one of the things that we have to keep in mind when we're asking for international intervention um, is thinking about what it actually is like to lose your your sovereignty and autonomy um, and have these life-changing decisions being made by people who are not of the community. And I think that resonates whether it's on a city level or on a national level or a regional level. And so, um, as a as a political scientist, I really am drawn to this concept of diaspora because one of the results of colonialism and U.S. imperialism has been the scattering of our communities across the world because conditions at home are so terrible. Um, and so, I actually was exposed or really learned about the issues of Palestine when I lived in Haiti and I went to school with a bunch of Palestinian Haitians, right? Um, And there are many Palestinian Haitians that actually are really um, famous, for example, uh, Natalie Andal, who is a a poet. Um, and And I was fascinated by this concept of diaspora besides understanding the root causes of why things aren't working, right? When they say, why can't we ever achieve democracy is something that is often said um, when looking at Haiti because of um, a succession of presidents and and uh, military interventions, et cetera. And the answer is truly US intervention. Um, well, US Canadian um, and UN intervention, and I'll talk about that a little bit later because that's who we're seeing at play right now. Um, but to understand Haiti, since before um, independence is to think about French as a colonizer who was able to extract so much wealth, um, so much wealth from Haiti that, you know, Haiti was known as the Le Pearl de, uh, de les Antilles, right? It was the Pearl of the Antilles because it was the biggest resource generating colony for France. Um, and it's partially why uh, Napoleon fought so hard to keep it because they knew that it would be a a devastating economic blow, which we know ends up leading to, um, after Haitian independence, the the Louisiana Purchase, because France could no longer afford the massive scale of their empire without Haitian resources and Haitian labor. Um, But since since that that fight, we have our lovely neighbor, the United States, uh, an aspiring colonial power, right? For those of us in Latin America, it is really hard not to see the United States as a colonizer, right? Um, Even though they may not have been the first to quote unquote discover, we know that um, their interests are are what guide everything that happens in the Western hemisphere for the the better or for the worse. Um, And so not only does does U.S. imperialism manifest in in a um, U.S. Marine occupation, uh, which Haiti experienced in the in the early um, ni- the early twentieth century, we also have um, 
intervention in the sense of participating in either military coups or directly um, pressuring a president to leave and to prop up presidents, which is what we're experiencing right now. So since since the um, assassination of of, of uh, uh, Jovenel Moise in 2021, uh, we have had this de facto president who is unelected, um, who whose name is um, is uh, Al Yel Ali, and we have zero plans for elections. Um, we have at this point no legislature because there haven't been elections. So the Senate and the Assembly folks, um, rather than continuing their roles unconstitutionally did give up their office when their term was over. However, there's been no no scheduling of any elections for that. And then we had, uh, we don't have a functioning Supreme Court because one died, one retired. And again, there's been no process to actually appoint anybody. So we are um, currently dealing with a situation where um, there's one man <laughs> and various international interests uh, particularly the United States and Canada, as I mentioned before, um, and the United Nations and the World Bank and some others um, who form this core group um, that are pushing, are making policy decisions and pushing for things like this uh, Kenyan-led UN mission uh, to quote unquote stabilize the country because we have um, this issue of these basically narco militias slash political militias. Um, I won't even call them gangs because they really are there to um, to terrorize and um, exert the will of whoever they are um, they are being paid by uh, versus necessarily a, a gang which has a, a sense of community and a, a, I will go in, I won't go into gang politics but um, one of the things is that uh, right now there have been in the last two years, there have been various demonstrations um, in the United States, in in Haiti, across the across the world, really, where there have been Haitians, um, various meetings with the United Nations to say um, Haiti does not want any U.S. presence. They do not want an occupation and they do not want uh, a U.N. peacekeeping mission. And partially that's because the peacekeeping mission that had been there for you know the basically the entirety of the the of the 2000s um has led to um sexual violence um has led to extortion has led to um cholera right and so there is rightly so a negative a negative association with outside forces coming to stabilize the country and the other being well what does stabilization mean because what we view as stabilization is very different than what um, the united states and others are thinking of stabilization um and so the other thing is that peacekeeping missions are actually paid for by the host country so having the kenyan um peacekeeping forces come to the country would cost Haiti $50 million, where like inflation is out of control, folks don't have access to basic needs, and where would this $50 million come from, right? This is another part of the discourse around um, the state of play right now. And and the, the mission is strictly to provide security for government buildings, not to actually fight or remove gangs. Really, it would serve to prop up Ariel Ali, who is again an unelected de facto president. Um, and so when we look at um, the destabilizing forces, not only is it that we we lack political leadership and infrastructure, um, which has been degraded, we also have this issue of the, the narco militias and political militias, which really, again, are, are linked back to the United States. So, um, we can look at the recovery of the earthquake in 2010, which is an example of disaster capitalism. Um, and we see that that folks were able to bring in resources and take them right back out without building any infrastructure um, and leading to all of these temporary camps. And this is when I, you know, I think of I think of Gaza as when I see the rubble because. <laughs> it takes so much to be able to rebuild and what does sustainable 
rebuilding actually look like that centers the most vulnerable, particularly women, LGBTQ folks, and and folks that are orphaned. And that is one of the issues that we are experiencing in Haiti um, because you know many of the folks that have been recruited into these militias as well as the victims are folks that were living in these temporary houses that turned uh, the the um, earthquake um, temporary shelters turned into shanty towns and ungovernable autonomous zones, um, which has been very you know difficult to be able to to address because of the lack of of government and other infrastructure. And so we see this mass displacement all throughout the hemisphere um, where there are um, there are over 500,000 folks who've applied for 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 the uh, US humanitarian parole program. Um, there are over 30,000 folks that were previously in Dominican Republic that have been returned back to Haiti. Um, and you see patients all across South America and Central America, um, and they are facing structural racism in the form of these various um, immigration policies and lack thereof, particularly because it's rooted in labor exploitation and the labor exploitation of women in particular. And so we know that um, Haitian women in the diaspora who have left in the last 10 years and who are um, really are crossing the Darien Gap are experiencing high rates of sexual violence um, and labor, labor exploitation. Um, and so there has been a large um, diasporic effort in Chile, Brazil, Ecuador, Colombia, Nicaragua, Mexico, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, and the Bahamas to really see um, how we can make sure to not just defend the rights of folks that are in the country um, and address the root causes of why people are leaving, but also make sure that the people that do leave are able to be um, in full dignity. And um, lastly, I know I may have gone over a little bit, um, I will say that uh, Haitian culture has this, um, there's this saying that women are the potomitan, which is the central, um, the central post to keeping a, a, the, the house structure stable, right? And so um, when we think about Haiti, even, you know, during slavery and, and independence up until now, women are really at the center of society and organizing in particular, and being this guiding and stabilizing force, um, whether it is in response to uh, the weaponization of rape and sexual violence, whether it's ethnic cleansing, which we're also experiencing with the Dominican Republic, whether it's um, US imperialism, women are at the center of being able to provide uh, solutions. And I'll stop there. Christina, thank you so much. It was so robust, so much information. I think how you started, I'm still thinking, I have chills thinking about Haiti delivering the first blow to colonization and Palestine delivering the final blow. And thinking about where all the sites, wherever, oppressed people show up, we are taking, we are chopping at the root. I want to give a shout out to one of our close partners in Haiti, Negus Mawon, who is a Black feminist, a Haitian feminist collective that's doing incredible work in Haiti. Um, and one of our dear partners in, in the work that we do. Mary, Mary Huffs, um, help us round out this conversation around providing context. So many of our folks um, have become familiar with the fight to, si to stop Cop City. And I was hoping that you could share a brief update around what's going on um, with the campaign and, and share, even though Cop City is a local fight inside the United States in the city of Atlanta, how does it connect it to our global struggles for liberation? Right on, right on. Thank you, uh, BFF, for having me and uh, all the panelists uh, and everybody who's who's present for this conversation. You know, the, the Stop Cop City fight, I think um, I'll start by saying that we're in a phase right now, and I believe it's, you know, actually been part of what has been so crucial to this campaign is to continue with it, to expose um, what is happening inside of the Black Mecca and make those um, and make those global connections. Um, because we know that Cop City isn't just, you know, uh, 
a physical training center, quote unquote, that is uh, going to be built here in Atlanta. But we know that there are other cities across the U.S. that have you know, have either made announcements, have broken ground, whether it be Nashville, Oakland, um, and there's several more that are planning to build Cop City. And so we want to be able to, you know, make sure that folks are being critically aware that though there has been a lot of juice and a lot of support for Cop City here, we know that Cop City is everywhere. And I think that over the last uh uh, since October, as more people have gotten radicalized by what is happening uh, in Palestine and learning uh, about the 70 plus years of struggle uh, that they have been waging, that folks are been making are making more clear the connections between the cop city fight here. So, for example, uh, we recently learned that uh, that there's a place <clears throat> in Palestine <clears throat> excuse me, that is, uh, you know, known as Little Gaza. And essentially it is a uh, a training ground for the um, Israeli Defense Force. Um, and it's set up like a mock city, uh, very much the way Cop City is proposed to be built here. Um, and so we know that our local leadership is conspiring with um, murderous, uh, the murderous military um, in order to build the same sort of of um, of yeah infrastructure to train the Atlanta police, who our city claims that they are not militarized, that they don't want to see them, that this isn't a step toward militarization. When the fact is, we're already there, and they continue to ramp it up. In addition to, there's a program here called the Georgia International. Um, uh, law Enforcement Exchange, Gilly, which is housed at Georgia State inside of the Andrew Young um, building, which is so bizarre given the uh, civil rights legacy that uh, he was a part of. Uh, and I could go, I have a lot of smoke for, uh, for um, Andy Young. And so I won't go down a rabbit hole around that, but it's also you know exposing how programs like these in a, in a black city um, can, you know, can continue to contribute to the legitimizing of the so-called Israeli state. Um, and I think that, you know, the campaign, part of what has been the beauty of it is because it's been so highly decentralized. And so we're just coming off of a week of action that was um, organized primarily by uh, forest defenders and some organizations here. Um, and really to be able with the goal of, you know, making sure we engage in mass mobilizations for people to participate um, in these weeks of actions. You know, not only did the Black Cop City action happen on November 13th, but a week leading up to that, um, several organizations came together and did political education uh, and did events to specifically talk to Black Atlantans around what is happening, what time it is on the world's clock, what what is Cop City, what is its impact as relates to um, you know folks who live here, and we had an opportunity to uh, to host the conversation with the Palestinian youth movement here and to talk about Black uh, Black uh, solidarity, Black liberation struggles, and the solidarity with. Uh, the, uh, the struggles around a free Palestine. And so I think like part of our work and role, you know, continues to be educating and doing the public education that is going to be so essential because though we have collected 116,000 plus petition signatures, um, our city has continued to, um, to deny, to delay um, us being able to get this on the ballot. And so there are some you know, we're in the 11th Circuit Court here, uh, super, super conservative. And so we are in that struggle uh, to continue to see how we chart a path to get this on the ballot uh, by March 12th. And we have our eyes set on 2025 because we know if you can't change the people, you must change the people. And so given, um, you know, what is before us with all of these signatures, all of these people, 60% of Atlantans uh, after a recent poll said, we want to be able to vote on this. We want to make sure that we uh, do the work to organize our folks into organizations and into work that will not just mobilize people to vote, but to have an organized vote um, when we uh, when we do show up on, on December 25th. Because I think it's also important to note that even with 60% of 
people in Atlanta saying we want to be able to vote about Cop City and our city continues to ignore us. Um, that 60% of uh, folks who live in America said that they wanted a ceasefire and our president and, and, and national officials continue to turn a blind eye. And so I think in all of this under the guise and, and, and of the, the Democratic Party. And so I think what this also gives us an opportunity to do is to continue to expose um, the cracks of the U.S. democracy and the bourgeoisie democracy um, and really set our sights on. We know that organizing and power building is not only just going to get the goods for where we live, but also has uh, grave impacts for um, for comrades abroad. And I think that we are seeing the impacts of foreign policy here in the US, here in Atlanta, um, on a very local level, and who are who are mayor uh, and, and police chiefs and, and who they're building relationships with. And so I think it's making us more um, more sharp uh, around how we how we engage local politics and that uh, act locally, think globally uh, becomes way more um way more sophisticated when uh we get into the nuts and bolts of who is who is who is responsible for the suffering of our people not just here but abroad um and i think the last thing that i will say is that um we're also seeing because this this campaign has been going on for over two years and i and i often will say that cop city um, has been winning already. It's winning already. They were supposed to do the ribbon cutting and champagne toasting back in the spring, but it was the courage of the forest defenders that have staved off the uh, the building of uh, this training facility. And unfortunately, uh, I think that was November 4th where 61 people uh, were, uh, um, were arraigned for the RICO charges. And they are using the journals of Tortiquita, uh, one of the forest defenders who was slain, beautiful genderqueer person who was slain by state troopers in a raid in that forest. And so we're seeing the ways in which um, the backlash of the state and the, the um, yeah, the ferociousness of the state when it comes to this fight um, is, so, is so cunning. And we're even getting word now, uh, Wednesday opens up the state, it's a special session and, and with the state legislature. And there's rumors that there is already going to be um, uh, proposed legislation that will um, that will essentially abolish referendums altogether on a uh, city or county level. And so we are already experiencing the, the backlash of the state. And so part of our work is to continue to make sure we are building power, not just in Atlanta, but across the state. You know, there were black folks in Sapelo Island fighting for their land who used the referendum in order to be able to advance their struggle. Um, there were folks in Camden County, which we modeled our work after, who was fighting against uh, Elon Musk and the Elon Musk and the folks who wanted to build a rocket launcher. And so it's an interesting fulcrum of how we, you know, are thinking about democracy in this time, how we are seeing militarization in this time, the ways in which uh, police and militarized police violence uh, becomes a topic of conversation and a, and a felt experience across the globe, um, rather be through military forces, uh, police departments, security forces, uh, vigilante violence, and all the ways in which um, we are seeing uh, state actors be positioned to engage in violence um, of all levels um, in order to silence uh, and in order to commit genocide. And so our hope is that uh, the work that happens here will you know, consistently be seen as a part of these broader struggles and hopefully inspire other people to continue to struggle. Thank you so much, Mary, for providing context um, around the fight to stop Cop City and reminding us that it's not just Atlanta. The idea is that they want Cop Cities everywhere. And also, it really is around the heart and mind around policing. And this idea of policing, control, colonization, imperialism is really the, the, the through line. And when I'm thinking about today for this panel, what I would want each person to walk away with is more information in their toolbox to think about how we can confront it. So I'm gonna ask each one of our panelists to come off camera now to offer 
solidarity. What does it mean to be in solidarity? What are some of the calls to action right now? Because we know, I'm going to tell y'all, there's something so incredible. I'm seeing the people in the streets. I'm seeing the people risk it all. People are, you know, risking their jobs, right? By speaking up around Palestine. People have are, have lost, you know, we have lost people, right? We have lost people um, in the forest in Atlanta. There are millions in the street right now. No one will ever forget the 2023. Um, and the, the millions of people across the world who've been in solidarity, that it is on the right side. Barbara reminded us the good company that we are in, um, that it's not up for debate. It's not complicated, right? That this is a, this is a, a um, this is about being aligned with the oppressed people of the world. So I want to ask each one of you, what are the calls of action? What would you ask? What would you have our the folks who are tuning in, whether that be on YouTube or right here in Zoom, to take action so that we can really not only just learn about it. Um, but really be about it, right? Black feminism really is around being about it. So I'm going to offer um, Jolie, if you don't mind, um, if you could spend maybe two to three minutes sharing how people can squat up for the people of Congo at this time. Oui, en ce qui concerne les actions, je, je dirais, euh, pour commencer, euh, je dirais d'abord que euh, les organisations féminines ici en RDC, il y en a. Euh, il y a beaucoup d'organisations, mais qui ne sont pas très actives sur le terrain. Ces organisations ne sont pas très actives sur le terrain. Je pense que il faut commencer d'abord par raviver ces organisations, les renforcer, faire un renforcement de capacité de ces organisations pour les rendre capables de mener des actions concrètes sur terrain. C'est très important. C'est vraiment important. Et je pense que la société civile, dans tous les pays, la société civile a une force incommensurable. Et vraiment, il faut, il faut qu'on renforce cette société civile féminine ici en RDC par des formations, des renforcements des capacités, etc. Parce que la situation est vraiment critique. La situation est critique et je pense qu'il faut commencer par là. Il faut pas seulement, il faut pas aller directement sur le terrain et commencer à faire des actions, mais il faut commencer à fédérer d'abord toutes ces organisations les former, les renforcer et ensuite maintenant faire des actions de terrain. Ça, c'est la plus grande faiblesse qui fait que les actions des femmes pour les femmes ne sont pas très concrètes ici en RDC. C'est la plus grande faiblesse de notre société. Donc voilà, tout se résume à ça. Jolie, I appreciate that very much. And if you could provide us a listing of some of the organizations that we should even be following, we could be connected with. I know that many of us would really appreciate that. Bisan, how about you? Could you share what does solidarity look like um, and how can folks really plug in um, to throw down to be in support with Palestine at this moment? Yes, uh, thank you. I would say, um, know that the Western, especially the American feminist movement space can be um, very Zionist uh, and understanding Zionism for what it is. It is a um, ethnocentrist, ethno supremacist ideology, the idea, and it is also a white supremacist ideology. And um, so understanding that and making decolonial feminism central to your work as in and this involves combating and confronting zionism and zionist feminist narratives and rhetoric um i would say that uh palestinian feminist collective has developed a toolkit and a reading list on settler colonialism and gendered violence palestinian youth movement we are continuing to put out um the the type of literature that is necessary to develop a robust understanding and framework around Palestine and like addressing um, Zionism in in your own 
locale in your context. And also recognize when Zionists are co-opting feminist, feminist rhetoric. For example, a lot has been coming out lately from um, Zionist actors uh, saying, uh, listen to women except when they're Israeli or just and, and and understanding that this is an attempt to appear uh, to appeal to liberal sympathies and these attempts will always at their core rely on the dehumanization and the demonization of Palestinians and Palestinian men um yeah so I, I would just say uh just understand how Zionist Zionism operates in your context and confront Zionism in your contexts, um, because this is absolutely essential to not only standing in solidarity with Palestinians, but also combating white supremacy as well. Thank you, Bissan. Barbara, I'd like to pull you in. You are an example of what it means to be a Black feminist in action and solidarity. And I'm curious around especially for the longevity, you know, we have a, our liberation and freedom is what we're about, right? And so that's not overnight, right? It's not a one-time event. And so based on your history of activism, what are some of the pearls that you could offer us as well as ways that we can be in solidarity right now? What are things that folks can do to be in solidarity um, with the oppressed people of the world um, during this critical time? Notice Paris comes to me when she talks about longevity. So I, I, I you know why that I, is. No, a, a shining example. Some of us can only hope, right? You are an example to us. I mean yeah. that with love. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been involved in some sort of struggle for the last 50 years. I'm 66. So it, it, it does feel um, like the long haul. Um, and So I think a couple of things. One is I think we have to see struggle as a process and a journey and not a destination. Uh, every goal post that we set is going to be moved. Even we, you know, we talk about ending the occupation. Well, in Palestine, you know, that's a complicated question now because, uh, you know, how do you define the occupation? I mean, occupation began in 48 and then expanded in 67. Uh, what does it look like to end occupation? And then after occupation is ended, just as when formal colonialism is ended in other places, what comes next? So, you know, there was a struggle, a slogan in the Portuguese struggle, a luta continua. And, and so it's like the struggle continues. And I know it is sometimes the kids in the backseat of the car are saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? We want to arrive at freedom land. But the idea that is that struggle is a way of life and that even when we re reach uh, benchmarks and uh, heights in our struggle, even when we have victories, uh, we have to continue to look for other ways to, to uh, you know, to fight for freedom because it, it is not an absolute and there will, there will be new ways of constraining and limiting um, us as human beings in this world, I think, unless we continue that a sort of revolutionary spirit. So I'd like to just also say you know, everyone mentioned colonialism, uh, and, and I do love that quote of uh, 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 Haiti to Palestine. But colonialism um, is a way to contextualize what we've seen develop in many places in the world, from Congo to Haiti to, to Palestine to settler colonialism here in the United States. But colonialism also has a context. And that context is uh, racial, and as M. Adams would insist that we say, racial gendered capitalism. So it is, uh, it, is, it is not just colonization for the sake of colonization. Land and location were fought for, resources were fought for, land was taken, bodies were stolen. Um, this was in the quest of profit and domination. And so we have to name that, you know, it's not just bad actors or people doing bad things to other people. There's systemic underpinnings. And I think when we understand that, it also gives us more fuel uh, to fight for the long haul because we're up against a very uh, large and complex uh, enemy and set of enemies. And I, I do use that term deliberately. 
But I think, how do we sustain ourselves? So I'm not basically an optimistic person. I'm more like, you know, I'm worried about everything. Even when we're winning, I'm like, okay, what's going to happen next? Something's bad. Something bad's going to happen. Um, but I do think, you know, that there's that Gramsci quote, you know, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. And for me, what that means is we always are thinking critically. We're always thinking of next steps, next level of liberation. But we also are struggling at the same time. We are not, we don't have the luxury of despair. We don't have the luxury of quitting. Um, so that's where the optimism of the will comes in. You continue to fight because you have to, because who are you if you don't, right? So I think of all the organizations all over the world, when I see the aerial view of all the demonstrations in solidarity with Palestine, you know, it lifts my heart uh, of, of people, you know, taking small and large risks, but it, it really, uh, you know, it really uh, lifts my heart. Uh, when I see the celebrations in Ramallah, you know, of, um, uh, people, many of them under administrative detention, you know, not e not even charged with anything, right? That's that's another feature of apartheid, you know, being released and the jubilance, you know, uh, uh, it lifts my spirit. So, so I think keeping in context, keeping a long term view, a multi generational view. So, you know, you're not, you, we may not see the freedom that we envision in our youth, in our lifetime, right? But it's still worth the fight. You're still a part of something. Um, you know, important. And, and and just concretely, I would say multi-issue struggles are important because you're looking at issues of women's liberation and, and gender justice and queer justice links us with people all over the world. Looking at issues of climate and environmental justice links us with people uh, uh, all over the world. Looking at anti-Blackness links us with people uh, all over the world. So so multi-issue is never a single issue that we're fighting around. I want to also commend BFF for having this be a translated event. The people in the United States are such linguistic chauvinists, um, you know, sort of covering our own uh, monolingualism. Uh, we often don't go the extra yard to make sure that there's translation. So and the fact that there's Creole translation is 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 wonderful. And then the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, read and travel. And uh, one of those things less expensive than the other, but we have to raise money for delegations. People have to go and meet people and build relationships and then don't just come home and forget about it and write an article, but stay in touch with those people. You know, and when I went to Haiti, it wasn't for a long time, but there were people in organizations like KFEM and Favalek and SOPA, uh, you know, in Palestine, the, um, organizers in Aswat, who we brought to the National Women's Studies Association conference. You know, these, you know, people become friends. And then, you know, you, you're thinking in flesh and blood terms about a struggle. It's not an abstractive struggle. And reading is important because we don't, we, it's irresponsible for us to be generically in solidarity, right? We have to be specifically in solidarity. In other words, we have to know struggles on the ground enough to really know who we're supporting and, and, to, and to build with them, right? When we were doing the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, there were a number of forces on the ground. And at one point they were uh, antagonistic toward each other. So then we had a set of principles by which we determined, you know, who are our comrades? You know, who are building a radical anti-capitalist movement? Who are building a movement that, that includes uh, 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 feminists and queer folks? You know, what? Where, where are the movements that resonate of a set of values and inclusivity um, that, that, that we um, are in support of? And that's not, that's not chauvinism. That's taking struggle seriously. Um, and people on the ground will tell you that. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, from Rojava, which are the Kurdish women fighting in, in Northern Syria to uh, Lakol fighting in Puerto Rico, uh, feminist collectives all over the world, are at, you know, in the center of these struggles and, you know, they are our people. They are our people. So learn some languages, read some books, get a passport and build organizations that are internationalist. That, the, hey, that, that sounds incredibly right, right on. And I really- And our about sisters in Brazil, business. of course, 
the black of feminist course. movement in Brazil that is so vibrant. That vibrant, Paris is wherever. Vibrant. I mean, I, I am also so encouraged, right? That, and I think you give us something to latch on to struggle. Being in struggle is a way of life. It's not just one time I clocked in to be an activist. To be a black feminist means to be committed to the liberation of not just yourself, but the community and the world. So it's gonna be a it's gonna be a ride, but it's gonna be worthwhile, right? So um, you're not doing it for clout, right? You're doing it, you're doing it for the people. So both Christina and Mary, if you could offer the the calls to action in the context of Haiti or Cop City, um, that our folks who've joined us can really plug into. Who would like to go first? Let me actually, Christina, how about you? It's funny because I said, let Mary go first. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I, so a few things. In thinking about being an internationalist, I think there are things for folks who have the privilege of US citizenship that can actually do, right? When we say that we're in the belly of the beast, we also have a moral responsibility being a part of empire willingly or unwillingly to be able to apply pressure in the United States regarding what they're doing abroad, which I think is what we, we are seeing with Palestine, but the same thing for Haiti, right? Is that um, US foreign policy is actually still something that we vote on. Voting is not the solution for everything, but it should be one of our priorities when we think about um, building uh, and like recruiting our own candidates and and also being able to support if you support someone to make sure that you actually know, are they anti-imperialist? I think that's something that that we should be able to commit to in the United States, given that our tax dollars um, are going towards killing people, right? And overthrowing governments. The other thing, um, and I would follow on uh, a US based organization I would name would be Haitian Bridge Alliance. Um, and so they're at they're at the great intersection of the Haitian diaspora throughout the Western Hemisphere, but really applying pressure to Biden um, and administratively working all of the mechanisms to get stuff done in terms of policy. And then for folks that are in Haiti, um, I would say there are two organizations that I really admire. One is Focal, which has been around for over 40 years, is a Black feminist organization. Um, and um, it's it the name stands for it's the foundation of rights and liberty, right? And so this they do deep political education. They also provide direct services and emergency assistance, but really go deep in what I love is the long Black feminist tradition of Haitian organizing. I have learned so much from their director. So shout out to them. And then um, there's also the Haitian Women's Collective, which uh, partners with Madre in the U.S., but they do um, a lot of um, sexual and reproductive health work, particularly for black uh, uh, for black women and queer folks, and making sure that they are able to have access to not just health care but their full full rights and citizenship. Um, and then I'm a part of this this network, the Hemispheric Network for Haitian Migrant Rights, and that will be my shout out. And it's a collection of over 50 organizations across the hemisphere that are dealing with the rights of Haitians in all the different contexts. Thank you. And Mary, how about you? What are What can you um, share with us for folks to be able to take action? How can they take action around Stop Cop City? Yes, well, I think, um... You know, I think Barbara said it, but I'm going to name it again. You must join an organization, period, point blank. You got to join an organization uh, and be engaged with one that, you know, its values and politics uh, and its strategies you are in, uh, are in alignment with. Um, and there are many organizations, you know, inside of Atlanta and outside that have, you know, given and supported um and contributed to the Stop Cop City fight here in Atlanta, but are also thinking about, you know, these issues of uh, the carceral system, policing, et cetera, et cetera, um, that, yeah, you should throw down with. And then it's Given Tuesday. I was like, it's Given Tuesday, friends. So all of these organizations, you know, that have been named, this is an opportunity for folks to give to them. 
uh, uh, give to organizations here, uh, like the Community Movement Builders and the um, the uh, uh, Save the Wilani Coalition, uh, and there's many others. But give to those organizations here and uh, you know nationally that are contributing to these efforts and our broader efforts um, uh, to to dismantle. Um, uh, all the mess, all the mess for lack of better words. I think it's also important in this time that people are engaging in power mapping. Cause like I said, you know, this is happening here but we know this is happening in many other places. And so uh, pulling people together and start asking questions, who's paying for this? Who's who's benefiting from this? Who getting money from, you know, which lobbyist? Um, and I think that's gonna be super important so that also can direct your actions and your energy towards shared targets and, folks who, um, you know, are contributing to all of our suffering. And I think it also helps people to be, um, you know, continue to be more radicalized by, you know, these big corporations aren't just, you know, you know what I mean? They aren't just like passing around cold Coca-Colas, okay? They they have an interest in the militarization, the mil in the, the Zionism and all the things. And there's a lot of, um, uh, what folks have been sharing around the boycott and how that, you know, people are making sure that the companies that, you know, are contributing, supporting, giving away free Starbucks, what have you, um, to uh, for what's happening in Palestine, like I would say easily 75 to 80 percent of those same companies uh, sit on the board of the Atlanta Police Foundation. So the boycott um, uh, that's happening as relates to Palestine is also deeply impacts what is happening here. And we must continue to engage the narrative and tell the story and make the connections more, cl uh, more clear uh, for our people. Um, and then uh, I, I was just, um, I was so inspired by what everyone has, has said. And I mentioned political education earlier, and I just want to make an offering for folks who have not seen it. If you need some inspiration, uh, there's a documentary called uh, Pray, Pray the Devil Back to Hell about the uh, women in Liberia and the struggle that was waged there. And the documentary, I think, is a really uh, beautiful um, contribution to not just inspire people, but I think also shows us what is powerful when women organize across, you know, it's multi-phase, age, et cetera, et cetera. So again, that's uh, Pray the Devil Back to Hell. And you can probably find that on most uh, platforms and Vimo, those sort of things. Mary, thank you so much. Um, so we're going to close out. And I want to close out. Um, I want to share a couple of things. So number one, we will be able to share this recording. It will be available as well as we're going to be having some graphic notes that are going to be available in those graphic notes um, and the sharing out. We will also share the resources that the incredible panelists have listed because we need to, we need to keep on sharpening ourselves. I want to give incredible gratitude to the folks who've tuned in to be in community, to learn, um, to again, to add more tools to the toolbox, to be in community, as well as deep gratitude to our incredible translation team, to Jami, who we can always count on to support us in creating spaces that are grounded in language justice. I'd also want to give a great shout out to the BFF team as well for your incredible hard work and to our panelists, to Barbara Ransby, to B. San, to Christine, Christina Francois, to Jolie Masai and Mary Hux. Thank you so much for being in conversation around how we are inextricably linked, how our struggles for liberation in Palestine, Congo, Haiti, and Atlanta and beyond um, are vitally important. I hope that you learned something today. And that also, if you visit this link, you will get access to the resources and ways to plug into the movement. So thank you team for that. For folks who may be new to Black Feminist Future, if you are a Black woman, girl, gender expansive person, you can be a member, join us. You can stay connected with us via the social media channels that are listed here. And as Mary mentioned, it is Giving Tuesday. And when you give, when you support Black feminist work, it allows us to bring programming, political education like this to you. So with tremendous gratitude, with our eyes stayed on freedom, 
understanding that revolution is not a one-time event, that we have work to do and we are in the good company of people who continue to change the world for the best. Um, thank you for joining this panel. Take care, be blessed, and may the revolution be continued. Thank you.